I think people still continue to treat MMT as an internet phenomenon. It's something that happens in the form of tweets and blog posts and something. But in, in reality, it's years of scholarly literature. And as Bill said, that's what MMT is. It's the label that we assign to the body of scholarly work that a handful of us spent years developing. Most of what's in modern money theory is not new. It was just forgotten. Hi everyone, and welcome to MMT Mondays. So tonight we're going to go back to the beginning and discuss the history of modern monetary theory. The origin of MMT began in the early 1990s as nothing more than a small discussion group of post-Keynesian heterodoxical economists. Intellectuals such as Warren Mosler, Randall Ray, and Pavlina Cherneva, among others, came to the realization that federal and treasury buying and borrowing, the bonds are functionally identical. They are the same operationally, just in two different branches. It began in the early 1990s when uh, the internet was relatively new. Again, we were talking earlier, uh, Al Gore had invented the internet. As you know. um, a discussion group uh, online was created, maybe one of the first, maybe the first, I don't know. It was called Post Keynesian Thought. And uh, post-Keynesian economics follows John Maynard Keynes, and it's what we call a heterodox approach to economics. It's outside the mainstream. But all the, the top heterodox economists uh, around the world were on this uh, discussion group. And this guy came on, and he started saying things that um, on the surface seemed very strange, very bizarre. <clears throat> but... Uh, as I read his comments and thought about them, I could see that he was just using different terminology. That a lot of things he was, he was saying existed in various branches of heterodox economics. <clears throat> and so online, uh, he would say things, and most people would respond, this is crazy. And then a few of us sort of started catching on. We said, oh yeah, that sounds like, okay, I'm in Minsky. That sounds like George Frederick Knapp, and so on. And so he started communicating uh, with us. And one of the ideas he had um, that became very important uh, to opening up this new approach to economics is he was a hedge fund manager who specialized in trading bonds. And sometime in the early 1980s, he said, you know, the Fed sells bonds. We call it monetary policy. It's called an open market operation. And the Treasury sells bonds. We call that borrowing. We say it's part of fiscal policy. He said, functionally, they are identical. They're the same operation by the government, just two different branches, the central bank branch and the Treasury branch. But for the non-government sector, the impact is exactly the same. Okay, And so when he wrote that, it just opened up our minds. We say, we've been looking at government finance wrong. Okay? And virtually all economists have got it wrong. So I'll come back to that and explain <coughs> uh, why this was so important. Uh, he wrote a little, pan uh, well, a thick pamphlet called Soft Currency Economics. That was the first publication that started to lay out this approach to um, economics and specifically to government finance. And um, then I wrote the book that uh, John mentioned, Understanding Modern Money, in 1998 that came out. And so that was the first academic publication of this approach to economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to meet uh, every year uh, with Warren, and we would say, how many people now understand what we're talking about? It took about five years to get up to the fingers on one hand. <laughs> and 10 years, we were up to, we had to use both hands. Okay. Uh, it was very rough going, very slow. Um, until the blogosphere. Now, just when you go home tonight, Google modern money theory. You're going to get literally millions of hits. There are thousands of around the world. Most of them not in academics, okay, 
a vast majority of non-economists, <clears throat> who could give a pretty good summary of what modern money theory is all about. So, and, and there actually are political movements now that call themselves modern money theory, in, for example, in Italy. Actually, there are several rival political movements that all call themselves modern money theory, um, which reminds you of Monty Python. <clears throat> so anyway, what I'm saying is it's just, it, it took off with the um, blogosphere. And so the main hurdle that the original founders of MMT faced was, as Randall Ray said, that for the first 10 years, they could count on one hand the amount of people who understood it. And so the main hurdle that hindered its initial growth was the strains of distance. Correspondences would take weeks due to the time it took to receive letters back and forth. And this all changed with the creation of online blogs in the early 2000s. MMT was able to ride the wave of the dot-com boom to where if you Google MMT today, you would get millions of hits. So overall, modern monetary theory and other non-mainstream schools of thought represent one of the largest existential hurdles we face as a society. It's the thought that just because something is new or unfamiliar doesn't make it wrong but rather a new approach to solving the long-standing attempt to provide more equitable outcomes for all. So in our second video, we will see an interview of Stephanie Kelton and Bill Mitchell discussing not only the origins of MMT, but their own personal journeys as well. In this video, Dr. Mitchell explained how the original Count on One Hand MMTers met in 1996 at a workshop in New York City. It was there that they laid out the foundation of what would become modern monetary theory. Look, it's a, it's a, there's vague origins. Um, and in my fourth year at Melbourne University in 1978, so that's in the honours year, the pre preparing for, to go on to do postgraduate studies, I wrote a, I wrote a thesis about uh, buffer stock employment models. And, you know, this, this was really not MMT, but it was about, how the state can use its uh, spending capacity to run both a full employment scheme plus a price stability scheme. And for those who have read my work, it was I got the idea sitting in a very wintry lecture theatre in Melbourne, which for you guys wouldn't be very cold, but for me is freezing. And uh, it was the lecture was in agricultural economics, and uh, it was about the Australian government's buffer stock wool scheme where to guarantee the price of wool to give farmers a, a guaranteed income, uh, uh, the, the government would buy up all the surplus wool if the market didn't want it, want it, and they would sell it back into the market if the farm supply was deficient relative to demand. And I wasn't so much interested in wool, but it was clearly a full employment of wool scheme. And, uh, and I was interested in uh, unemployment at the time because it, it, in the late 70s, it was when basically the neoliberal period started in Australia and unemployment was starting to rise. You know, historically it had been less than 2% and started to rise five, six and so on. Now, th now that just sat there in my mind. I wrote that and sat there. And of course I was a, you know, post Keynesian and uh, I believed in the use of deficits and all the rest of it. Uh, but but then we met up in the early 90s. So I think about history, you know, the, the, the facts will correct me, but let's say 93, 94, something around that date, uh, the internet was becoming a reality and uh, we'd moved beyond the, the early bulletin boards into email lists. And the, uh, an email list began called the Post Keynesian Theory List, the PKT list. And uh, this was this was a fantastic thing because it it completely eliminated the tyranny of distance between academics in because Post Keynesians are in a minority. We used to meet up maybe once or twice a year at different conferences, but we didn't have regular. Uh, you know, exchanges, we'd have to wait three or four weeks if you're in Australia for a letter to, to, to read somebody or whatever. And on that list, we started talking about things about post-Keynesian theory and um, 
one of the members of that list was Warren. And Warren had, had just written a, uh, a document. He came from banking uh, and, in, and financial markets. And he had written a document called Soft Currency Economics. And within that document was, um, uh, part of that document was an outline of a full employment scheme, which he called employer of last resort. And of course, that was the job guarantee scheme that I'd written about in 1978. And so that, that immediately was very interesting to me. And uh, soon after, I got a call one Saturday from this very uh, American chap on the phone saying, look, I'm in Sydney, I'm Warren Mosler. I can't imitate an American accent. Uh, he said, I, I want to come and see you. Because, and it was based upon what we'd been writing in this mailing list. And so Warren duly headed up the highway to where I to Newcastle, where I was at that stage. And uh, we had a really nice lunch and we talked about things. And Warren brought a lot of knowledge of banking that, that I didn't have. Uh, you know, I had other, I had the other sort of knowledge. And uh, and to me, that was the beginning of my involvement in what later has become called MMT. Now, Warren, meanwhile, back at the ranch, was building, uh, was was bringing together people like, as I understand it, Randy Ray and Stephanie, who were the very early ones he brought together. And Stephanie will correct me if I'm wrong. But sooner, soon after, I think it was in 1996. I can't remember the exact. It was in your winter, so it must. It was early in the year or late in the year. We um, <clears throat> all met up in New York. Now, I don't know if Stephanie was there. It was a, it was a workshop sponsored by the uh, New School. And that was the first time that we had all come together physically. And I'm, I'm saying all because the joke in those days was that uh, you could count, count the MMTs on one hand. So we're, we're only talking three or four of us got together at that workshop. And that really began it. And uh, that, so that's the origins of it. Then we started to write things and uh, build a progress, sequentially build a coherent body of literature, which, which you now have and which we now call MMT. The, the social media developments, but that was the, that were the, they came later in the sort of around 2004, but Around 1994, the, the, the network was starting to be put together by, by different interactions, which, which we now see as the sort of academic and the intellectual beginnings and the, the internet intellectual group that began all of this. 1994, I think it was. And so Stephanie Kelton also goes into her journey from studying the works of Veblen and Marx and Keynes to discovering Warren Mosler's soft currency of economics, which she described as a true game changer for her, essentially. So while naysayers will try to discount MMT as some internet sensation, MMT represents the culmination of years of dedicated scholarly work. The internet and social media growth only came along later uh, as a demand for a voice and to engage in the much larger economic debate. I was you know, pretty open to the idea that things might not be what other people conventionally, how they describe them. But Warren's stuff, I have to say, it just struck me um, as wrong. It struck me as wrong. And what Randy and I started going back and forth. Randy was working on his book, Understanding Modern Money. And I kept saying, this isn't right. This isn't right. And Randy said, well, write it up. You know, he would want to know if it's wrong. He, he would want somebody to point it out. So you should write it up. So I start digging into the really detailed stuff about government finance operations, all this, you know, weedy stuff. And I start tracing through the argument and I arrive at exactly the same place that Warren arrived. I just made a much more complicated argument out of it. And that's how I persuaded myself that Warren had that Warren was correct and that what he was describing about the way the modern monetary system works, the operations, uh, the accounting, and so forth, that it was all very correct and that it really mattered that we were getting these things wrong. So 
that's I simultaneously encountered Warren and Wynne Godley and all of that at Levy. And then, you know, the rest is history, as they say. I, we all ended up at UMKC together, Randy, Matt Forstatter, Pavlina, and I, and um, and then the burgeoning of the literature that Bill refers to. You know, it's sort of funny that I think people still continue to treat MMT as an internet phenomenon. It's something that happens in the form of tweets and blog posts and something. But in, in reality, it's years of scholarly literature. And as Bill said, that's what MMT is. It's the label that we assign to the body of scholarly work that a handful of us spent years developing. Um, and the internet stuff came later when we wanted to enter the fray um, mostly for me anyway, uh, as part of the financial, uh, during the financial crisis and the aftermath. And we wanted to try to have a voice in those debates. And we used social media to have that immediate impactful entry point to, to give us an opportunity to engage. So I, I want to just say you guys have the patience and stamina of gods it, it, it's it's amazing to me because i know just as a lay person that has a little bit of training dueling with with people that have run for president and and people that are running for office and and just the regular you know fanfare of the social media world but just trying to crack through and break through old things i mean i've been called a cult leader I've been called uh, all kinds of like I'm selling a scam, a psyop, or this or that. I have no idea what you just said, which is it's an incredible, huge body of scholarly work, real, honest to goodness, forensic work that has nothing to do with Facebook or Twitter or anything else. This is just a vehicle by which we have to use to get this word out. So as you can see, Modern monetary theory fits so well into this heterodoxical approach to economics because, as Warren Mosler stated, MMT grew from ideas first, but only after did they find a, a historical precedent that was always there. As we saw, after further research, it was discovered that this economic model had many similarities with previous economists. Mosler mentioned that many economists and other influential government figures were proposing many of the same comments of it, or concepts of MMT back in the mid and early 1940s. It all goes back to what I mentioned in the beginning. Just because something is new or challenges the status quo of accepted thinking does not make it bad. Rather, once we have the ability to sit down and discuss ideas, we see that we may have more shared values and principles than previously thought. And in similar fashion, what establishment politicians, pundits, and other historians who attempt to debunk MMT, they just simply fail to understand how currency works. And because of that, they don't find historical evidence of it because they don't really know what to look for. MMT is not just some internet phenomenon of tweets and blog posts, but they're, rather they're years of scholarly literature that dedicated economists spent years developing. So... I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to check out our website, as well as follow us on Facebook, Internet, Twitter, Rockfin, and anywhere else. So, until next time, y'all have a great week. Hey.